So it's my real pleasure to kick off this important symposium or virtual event with the first talk. And indeed, metabolomics today has uh, formed the basis so that we can work on the vision to integrate knowledge on genes, environment, and lifestyle, use this molecular phenotyping to understand the plethora of diseases, such as, for example, diabetes, allergies, or heart diseases, and to contribute to public health by better diagnosing these diseases early on and provide treatment for those. And the vision behind that is that our environment and our genes shape the way how we respond and how we can sustain healthy aging. And the metabolites, which is our vision of how the nutrients as well as external uh, substances can enter our body and how the endogenous produced small molecules control our um, pathophysiology and our physiology is, has been really a key. And while I was still kind of developing the phenotyping of the CORA cohort, it was actually Jurek Adamski together with Christian Giger, Carsten Sure, uh, Thomas Illich, Gabi Carsten Miller and others who started to develop this idea of linking, of first of all measuring metabolites in blood samples and then linking them to genome-wide association studies. And this was a time in the early 2000s when we started to use these large-scale genotyping endeavors to understand the genomic architecture and to find novel association for the major diseases. However, everybody was at the first instance disappointed to find only a small fraction of the disease burden explained by these single nucleotide polymorphisms. This really was changing when metabolomics entered their stage and it was discovered that if you link the genetic architecture with the metabolites, that then you can explain up to 60% of the variation in the metabolites. And it really showed powerfully that the metabolites are in the pathway from the genes to disease and that they can also be influenced by our environment as well as our characteristics. And so one highly cited paper out of these early times is when we looked at gender specific metabolite profiles and it was discovered that indeed men and women have um, very different metabolites. So it was not the surprise that men and women are different, but it was the recognition that you can see this very clearly on metabolites, but then would also be linked to disease and well-being. Similarly, so looking at aging, one of the underlying drivers of our disease development, one saw that metabolites are really different and that different clusters change over the life course. Here, looking from um, adulthood into older age. And again, this was different between men and women. So moving forward, one of the first discoveries we done here at the Helmholtz Center to, together with Zurich was to identify three metabolites which were representing clusters of lipid, acetyl, acetyl carnitines, and amino acids, which were very distinct patterns associated with pre-diabetes, here shown by the IGT, the impaired glucose tolerance, and a word type 2, uh, type 2 diabetes. And again, it was the richness of the cohort study, which not only allowed to um, measure the metabolites, but also to adjust for conventional risk factors. And thereby, it's showing that these three metabolites were independent of the other traditional risk factors. And similarly, in the EPIC cohort, 
the same metabolites were identified in parts and also clusters were identified and we will hear later from Anna um, more about these discoveries and on building work upon that. And I would like to draw your um, attention to the Lippi, Lippi, um, the oh, first what did you, Colleen 18.2, which not only was associated with the incidence of type 2 diabetes, but also with the incidence of myocardial infarction in further follow-up work. And this also highlights one of the powers, but also potential one of the areas where we need to further invest into, namely if we want to use the metabolites as diagnostics, we have, they have the power to identify pathways, but then we also need to make them specific for certain diseases. And we probably will hear a lot about the ongoing efforts in this area, also from the multi-omics arena following further up on this. And another area where metabolomics proved to be really powerful was to disentangle the role of long established treatments such as metformin, where one could show by using metabolites which pathways would be triggered and how they would, were inter, are interconnected in activating pathways which then are consistent uh, with the effect of metformin in abating diabetes on the one hand, but also having a positive impact on cardiovascular disease, as well as potentially contributing to an improved longevity, which is also being discussed for metformin. And it's indicated through the pathways, which could be identified and further linked through looking at metabolites. This theme is now kind of continuing in ongoing work using the metabolites as indicators for risk to developing type, type 2 diabetes complications. And again, this is another example of re very recent work of Jurek Adamski to work together with Rui van Sadler and her PhD student, which in, again kind of shows the potential to disentangle those people who develop complications of type 2 diabetes and those who do not. So the metabolites are one important area. However, we are also looking now much more at on the endocrine system as such. And there's also the option not to only look at metabolites, but also look at distinct hormone profiles. And again, this is one very recent example looking at all course mortality in the CORA cohort, where, for example, the low testosterone levels associate with a decreased risk of mortality in men. However, this is different if you look at women. And again, this points towards really using metabolites, hormones, and environmental factors together to understand the differences in disease development in men and women. And so indeed, this is the vision moving forward of the exposome so that we can nowadays with digital tools, modeling, as well as blood, mar blood marker measurement, really can fully characterize a whole suite of exposures that we can use the metabolome not only to characterize external exposures, and we probably will hear again more about this throughout the talk, but also to look at the fir first internal responses. And then again, look, lose, use traditional disease characterization, digital tools, as well as imaging for better disease characterization. And you may imagine while in the beginning, smaller cohorts such as the core cohort were sufficient in moving forward this vision, we nowadays need much larger databases to really be able to disentangle these differences. And the German national cohort, the NACO cohort, is one endeavor set up to do so. It aims at identifying a novel pathway linking risk to disease, to look at the disparities in health across Germany, to develop novel risk prediction for personalized prevention, 
and to develop novel markers and tools for early detection of disease. We do that by having recruited more than 200,000 men and women in the age range 20 to 69 years and cover the entire Germany with 18 study centers. The study has a 30 years perspective and was funded by the German Federal Ministry for Education and Research, the participating federal 13 states and the Helmholtz Association. This is the broad range of collaborator, collaborators who are also members of the NACO EV, being the host institution for the NACO. Up to now, as I said, we have recruited more than 200,000 individuals and 60,000 of them received an in-depth examination at, as baseline. And we currently have followed up more than 41,000, even through the corona pandemic, which was quite a challenge. The unique characterization of the NACO is that we have five imaging centers which have examined more than 30,000 individuals and we already have now since 2019 re-examined 6,000 of them. And what is also unique for the NACO is the high quality biosamples and, and therefore we, we, we foresee that omics and also in particular metabolomics will play a major role in future analyses. At the Helmholtz Center Munich, we have built a dedicated biorepository where we have a semi-automated minus 80 degree storage and we're just building up and now finalizing the fully automated minus 180 storage capacity. And with having complete cooling chain from the examination side, using robots to pipette pip pip the um, samples up to tran transporting everything cooled to the um, central biorepository, we feel that we have really unique samples in hand for future research. And our vision is to have all participate genotype and sequence and to start off with a multi-omics layer. Of course, we would also have um, metabolomics, proteomics, epigenomics for everybody. However, we feel that starting first multi-panel would be very advantageous. And another unique feature is that we have samples for microbiomics. And so, for example, would be able to link on a large scale the microbiota with metabolomics in understanding disease, which I think is, is a very important and emerging area. In summary, studies like the, the past work, as well as large scale studies, which are now emerging and are diligent being pursued, will allow to use the metabolome as a critical, critical link between exposure biological biological responses and disease outcomes. Here we are, we are really foreseeing and also will hear already today very novel and important insights to really shape the future of prevention, to understand the effectiveness of interventions, to develop preventive treatments and also move forward the planetary health in the Anthropocene because we are in a changing world due to the corona pandemic, but also due to the climate crisis, which will, will govern a lot of our health concerns. And the biomedical research we have been jointly pursuing and are planning for the future will help with that. And so I would dearly like to thank everybody in the CORA study and beyond who, per, who was part of these journey to discover the role of metabolites and now is also part of moving the narco forward. Thank you very much.